Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you. See, unmute myself. Okay. There we go. Okay. This is a one, one man show. So I do uh, the production and uh, the camera and the lighting and, and all of that. And uh, that's why it's not uh, exactly perfect, but uh, I think we get the, the job done in our conversations here Monday mornings. Uh, and again, I want to thank you all for, for joining me today. Uh, Max is here as, as usual. He's paying a lot of attention. Uh, sometimes when uh, he doesn't agree with what I say or he gets bored, he just leaves. So he's he's free to go about as he likes. Uh, anyways, we've uh, got a nice day here. And once you know it, uh, exactly a, a minute before uh, we we started this uh, little program of mine, uh, the doorbell rang and it was the sprinkler man. So the sprinkler man is here and uh, that's the official start of uh, spring and summer as far as I'm concerned. So I'm very excited about that. It's conceivable uh, that he'll uh, interrupt us uh, along the way, but uh, ho hopefully not. I, I told him uh, be back in half an hour. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, discuss uh, the uh, what's important to us uh, professionally, and that's the, the markets and uh, the economy, the Fed and inflation, and a whole bunch of other things that uh, are relevant to what, what do we do for a living. Uh, well, let's see. What is there to talk about? Uh, it's a pretty light week in terms of uh, economic indicators. Uh, at the end of the week, uh, we get the uh, leading economic indicators and uh, the coincident economic indicators. Uh, I think it's time for a product recall on the index of leading economic indicators. It's just not working. And I think the reason for that is because it's um, biased towards the good side of the economy, uh, which hasn't really been in a recession. It just hasn't been growing. So it's it's a growth recession. Actually, when you look at uh, consumer spending on goods, uh, what's really quite uh, remarkable is that we had this buying binge. Uh, we all participated. Don't 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 pretend that you didn't. Uh, we all uh, got locked up there for a couple of months. We all had cabin fever. We all uh, wanted to get some dopamine in our brains to make us feel better. So shopping does that. And so we went shopping. But uh, we couldn't go to restaurants all that much. There was still a lot of social distancing. Uh, we were a little bit concerned about getting on an airplane. So uh, in order to go shopping, we had to focus on goods. And there was this big surge in demand for goods. It lasted about a year or so. Uh, we all did it pretty quickly. And then it, uh, it, it, it stopped. But it really didn't stop. It's not like suddenly we stopped buying goods. And it's not even like suddenly uh, the... the uh, Demand for goods declined. There was no recession there. It just went sideways. It went sideways at an all-time record high, which when you think about it is quite remarkable because you would think after a year of going on, eh, there he is. Uh, hopefully somebody's there to d deal with that. Um, Max will take care of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the consumer uh, goods uh, has been absolutely flat uh, for the past uh, couple of years. Uh, but it's been flat at a record high. So people are still buying goods. Um, it uh, Apparently, retailers just really got uh, taken uh, taken up with a, a tremendous buying bench, and they simply ordered too much in inventory. And so we did have an inventory correction in retailers. So there was an inventory recession, if you will, in merchandising. Uh, but the actual demand for goods has been remarkably steady at an awfully high rate. It's the uh, services that have been uh, very high. Uh, well, so the economy continues to to do well as a result of that, and uh, the Fed uh, has to address this issue uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. They'll have their uh, their meeting, and when that meeting is over, Fed Chair Jerome Powell will have his uh, press conference. And uh, what I would expect that uh, he'll do is uh, dial back. He said that uh, in his uh, press conf in his uh, in his congressional testimony. A couple of weeks ago, he got us all excited about how the Fed is not far off uh, from dialing back on restriction. I think uh, on Wednesday in his presser, he's going to be dialing back from his dialing back a statement about uh, re restriction. Uh, the economy is doing fine. The uh, consumer is spending. Uh, capital spending is hanging in there. Uh, a lot of excitement about artificial intelligence 
in a lot of capital spending going on for GPUs and uh, related equipment that are necessary to run the AI software. A lot of money is going into R&D spending uh, on AI. So the economy is in good shape. Meanwhile, uh, everybody says, well, inflation was hotter than expected last week. Uh, it was a bit uh, hotter, uh, but that's when you look at it month by month, and that's when you really get into the weeds and look at all the details. When you do the year-over-year -year percent change, which is really what the Fed monitors, it's, it's really looking at the year-over-year -year percent change, uh, but I guess on Wall Street, we have to keep ourselves busy and uh, show how smart we are by looking at all the individual components. See, uh, look at uh, motor vehicle insurance and health insurance and uh, look at uh, rent and rent inflation is going uh, up in small cities, down in little cities. I mean, it can make, may make your head spin uh, unless you really love that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, I, I do like that kind of stuff, actually. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's you know, we're getting lost in the weeds, uh, getting uh, lost uh, uh, in the weeds and not seeing uh, the, the big picture. And the big picture is that if you take the shelter out of the CPI uh, headline, uh, you get a number of 1.8% uh, for the year over year for the CPI through February. If you take out shelter from the core CPI, you get 2.2%. So you know how the kids, uh, when you're on a long trip, say, are we there yet? We're there, except for shelter. And uh, yeah, I know that, uh, shelter, as I said, rent inflation is going up in some small cities and down in the big cities. But on balance, it's going down in terms of year-over-year -year percent change. I think it's going to continue to go down. And as that happens, uh, then uh, the overall CPI core and headline I think will be had, will be in fact achieving the Fed's two percent by year end, and the same thing I think goes for the personal consumption expenditure deflator. More so for the CPI because shelter is a bigger component of the uh, CPI, but I think PCED inflation is also going to be uh, moderating. So why mess with success, um, especially if uh, you know uh, the numbers last week on a month over month basis? were somewhat higher than higher than expected. So I think Powell is going to sound a little bit more hawkish and a little less dovish. I think he's going to uh, dial back, as I said, on the not far off from dialing down on um, on the restriction that has been imposed over the past couple of years. And I, I think they have to be somewhat concerned about a third mandate, which is not really a legal mandate, but their dual mandate is to keep the unemployment rate down. And by the way, the unemployment rate has been down below 4% for 25 months in a row through February. I know it went up to 3.9%, but it was still under 4%. And the way initial unemployment claims are going so far in March, I think will be, again, for the 26th month in a row, below 4% uh, on the uh, unemployment rate. This is uh, the longest stretch of sub 4% unemployment that we've seen since the late uh, late 1960s. So you have to go back a while ways to see the economy doing this well. Actually, I think the economy was uh, on that course before the pandemic. We were below 4% for several months uh, prior to the pandemic, and then the pandemic hit. And now we're, we're back. Uh, the, the labor market sure, clearly is tight. There really is a shortage of, of labor supply, at least skilled labor supply. Uh, I guess we'll have to see how the uh, illegal uh, immigration, undocumented workers, as some some uh, uh, call them, um, others call them uh, newcomers, whatever you call them. Uh, we're talking about millions now, not uh, thousands, uh, but a, a few million of uh, new new uh, people coming into the country. And the question is, uh, one, will they be allowed to work? And two, will they even be allowed to stay? And uh, some of that's going to depend, of course, a lot of that will depend on uh, who the next uh, president is. So I guess that's why we we can't really do much in terms of factoring in the uh, migrant uh, situation in terms of uh, the labor force. But for now, let's take what we got. And what we got is uh, uh, a supply of labor, particularly skilled labor, uh, that uh, is uh, not uh, that is re relatively tight relative to uh, to to demand. Uh, so I, I think that um, the Fed uh, will uh, signal in its uh, 
summary of economic projections uh, that uh, they're still intending to cut um, the federal funds rate uh, two, maybe three times this year. I will not be surprised if it turns out that the Fed doesn't cut the uh, Fed funds rate at all this year. Though in the morning briefing today, I do also uh, layer in the uh, the political uh, calendar that we've got here. We've got a uh, Democratic and Republican convention during the summer. It's kind of unlikely that the Fed's going to want to do much, if anything, other than say that they're watching the situation uh, this summer. So if they want to cut interest rates, if they desperately have a, a need to cut interest rates, uh, they better do it uh, in the next couple of meetings before they get into the summer. But that's clearly not what's going to happen. So uh, the, the next opportunity uh, to cut rates, I think, will be after the election. And so I think there is actually a meeting on November 6th and 7th. So it may be that far off before they actually do something, if it's warranted. And then if it's really warranted, they'll do uh, another cut in, in December. Now, what would warrant uh, lowering interest rates? Uh, well, as I've been uh, pointing out, um, recessions uh, historically seem to have be caused by a process. Uh, the Fed tightens uh, monetary policy, raises interest rates uh, because inflation is a problem. Sometimes it's just price inflation. Sometimes it's just speculative bubbles and asset prices. Sometimes it's both. And as the Fed raises interest rates, at some point, something breaks in the financial system. The uh, bond market figures out that that may happen. And so you start to get an inversion of the yield curve. So the inversion of the yield curve signals that if the Fed continues to tighten, something will break in the financial system. And then lo and behold, invariably, something does break in the financial system. At least that's been the, the, the history since the 1960s. Uh, and then uh, historically, that very quickly turned into an economy-wide credit crunch so that even uh, good quality credits, borrowers uh, can't borrow, and uh, very quickly you get a recession. So the whole idea that monetary policy operates with a long and variable lag, I think this was an idea that Milton Friedman uh, uh, promoted, and uh, his idea was that, uh, look, uh, you can't uh, respond to the economy with monetary policy like immediately, you've got to think ahead. And so his whole shtick was uh, you want money supply to grow at a consistent uh, pace, uh, at a constant pace, and be predictable. And um, that's the way you deal with long and uh, that's the way you don't have to deal with long and variable lags. Uh, you you manage the, the the monetary policy correctly, and you don't have to worry about uh, recessions. Everything just uh, works hunky dory. Well, um, in the the the, the uh, in my analysis of uh, the historical uh, experience, it's been those credit crunches caused by uh, crises that cause uh, re recessions. So could we have a recession without a financial crisis causing a credit crunch in a recession? Of course we could. Uh, consumers may decide to retrench. Maybe Jamie Dimon will be right that they finally run out of excess savings. Maybe that thesis was right all along. It's just they had more of it than uh, people anticipated. And suddenly they feel they have to, to save more. Uh, I've been arguing that uh, the problem with that uh, thesis is it misses the fact that uh, while excess savings during the pandemic uh, was large to the tune of two to three trillion dollars, uh, we're now seeing baby booms retiring uh, with a nest egg of seventy five trillion dollars. Uh, so uh, so there's a uh, there's a whole cohort of retiring people that uh, suddenly realize that they're days of, uh, of of making money uh, and saving uh, for retirement, uh, that, that's bit behind them. And now they're actually retiring. And if they did really well, they maybe can live off the interest income, the dividend income, the rental income of the assets they've accumulated. If they didn't do that well, they have to start dipping into those nest eggs and spending that money. In any event, they're not going to be doing the kind of savings they were doing when they were working. So the savings rate stays down which means that disposable income, uh, that consumption will grow at the same rate as a disposable income. You know, there's not going to be as, as much of disposable income going into uh, rebuilding savings. And then the younger folks, as I've mentioned before, the, uh, are looking at their parents and wishing them well, wishing them health, hoping that they 
live a long life, but they also wish they don't spend too much of what they've accumulated so that there's something left over uh, for uh, uh, for uh, those who uh, will be mourning the dearly departed. Uh, but they'll more or less, obviously, if the dearly departed leave a nice little uh, uh, bequest for for the kids. Meanwhile, while we're all alive and breathing and doing well, I saw a statistic somewhere, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, that something like 50% of uh, young adults are still being supported by their parents because life is just so expensive. Uh, I got some of that going on in, in, at home here, but uh, I'm not going to get into the de details of that one. Uh, but uh, as Peter Lynch uh, once pointed out, uh, look around you, see what's going on with your family, with your job, with your in your community, and uh, draw some investment implications from all that. And so, you know, the implication is that, uh, yeah, they do these surveys where people say, you know, I live paycheck to paycheck, and uh, I actually run out of money uh, before I get my next paycheck. And some of those people are probably uh, young young kids who forget about the uh, extra few bucks that uh, the the old man and old lady uh, provide them uh, to uh, make ends meet. So there's uh, there's a lot going on in our economy. There's a lot going on with the consumer. And I don't really expect the consumer just willy-nilly suddenly re retrench. It usually takes job losses. Uh, and job losses uh, usually require that uh, uh, credit conditions are so tight that uh, everybody, uh, uh, employers are forced to cut back their costs and and so on and so forth. So I'm not, I'm still in the no hard landing camp, uh, no recession camp. Still think that inflation is moderating down to two uh, percent. Uh, increasingly thinking that uh, maybe there's really no reason for the Fed to to lower interest rates, and if they do it. Uh, too, too prematurely without call. And again, the main reason that they've cut interest rates in the past had nothing to do with long and variable lag suddenly causing a recession. What it had to do with is that uh, at some point, tighter monetary policy caused a financial crisis, caused a credit crunch, caused a recession. And this time around, we got some of that. We did have a, a banking crisis last year, but it lasted basically a weekend. That uh, SVB was March 10th, essentially. Um, and on March 12th, for Sunday, the Fed came out with a bank uh, liquidity facility that uh, really uh, did a great whack-a-mole job of uh, averting a uh, financial crisis, turning into a credit crunch, turning into a recession. Um, all right, let's go look at some uh, some charts here that might be relevant. Hopefully, they're not irrelevant. And let's uh, share them. Let me have a little drink of water here. Let's see, let me check to see if Max is still with us. Yeah, he's still paying attention. He's really enjoying this conversation. I hope you are too. Um, anyways, uh, federal funds rate futures. This is the nearby, which is basically the Fed funds rate and the 12 month ahead. And uh, you can see here that uh, there was expectations of something like, like five or six uh, cuts in the uh, federal funds rate uh, over the next 12 months uh, back in January. Now we're uh, we're basically at uh, two, two to three three cuts. And uh, I will not be surprised if the SCP, the summary of economic projections, uh, is altered a bit to show uh, two rate cuts. And uh, Powell has mentioned before that um, when they put the SCP together, they, they don't cheat. They don't, uh, I, I mean, they must talk to each other about these things, but it's not like they try to influence each other during the meeting. So no, no, we this is this is not going to convey the right message. Uh, they apparently do independently uh, pencil in or pen pen in uh, ink in what they think is going to happen to the uh, Fed funds rate uh, during the year. So in the December meeting, they were talking about uh, basically three uh, rate cuts, and I think that'll be uh, it. Could very well be par pared down to to two rate cuts. Uh, again, their credibility is at stake. They uh, they they want to want to come across as as hawks on uh, on inflation. They don't want to overdo it and cause a recession if they don't have to. Uh, but on the other hand, if they uh, if there's no risk of recession, what's the rush to lower interest rates and take a chance that uh, suddenly inflation is more of a problem than they had anticipated? This is another uh, way to see how the market's thinking about where rates are going. I, I view the two year 
as a proxy for where the market thinks uh, the Fed funds rate is going uh, a year from now. And that's also consistent uh, with three rate cuts. Uh, and again, I think I think there's still some lingering thoughts about uh, three uh, rate cuts. I think it's going to be pared down to, to two and maybe before we know it, to, to no rate cuts, depending on how things unfold. Uh, this is um, a fun chart. It's certainly colorful. Um, and uh, the blue shaded areas show you the uh, last, uh, the fourth term of uh, the, the four-year presidential cycle. And it's, uh, doesn't, it's independent of whether presidents get reelected re or not. It just uh, is an indication of, uh, and the Fed funds rate. So the question is, uh, is there a history where the Fed has on a regular basis uh, been apolitical and tried to avoid it all, if, all, if at all possible, doing anything with the federal funds rate uh, during uh, an election year. And uh, it's kind of mixed, quite honestly. Sometimes they they do what they have to do in a situation like like this, but where politics just uh, is not something they they, they want to th think about. Um, even over here, you see that uh, the Fed funds rate was declined declined and then paused down here. Here, when we're looking at uh, we're look we're more interested in periods when rates were high and they were bringing them down. They did pause uh, in this in this uh, experience here. They paused here. Uh, here they didn't pause. They paused before the election year, and then they lowered interest rates. Um, so it's kind of um, there, there is there is no uh, clear cut um, indication. But you know, I may, maybe they. I I, I kind of doubt that they 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 discuss politics during the meeting because the meetings are in fact uh, uh, transcribed, and uh, I guess five years later we get to see what they really said. Uh, but uh, they. Uh, and do the best they can to at least uh, pretend uh, that uh, politics is uh, not uh, a driving force in monetary policy. Uh, this is uh, just a, another chart showing uh, how the stock market does during the fourth year. And uh, it uh, it does uh, reasonably well, 6.2%. We're already up 7% uh, year, year, year to date. So uh, we, we've already kind of filled the quota for what the market's supposed to do on average. But of course, there's a lot of variability around that. And I'm still looking for the market to be uh, somewhat higher by year end at 5,400. Some people will have asked me, why not raise your, your target now that we're, you know, we're so close to 5,400? And the answer is because. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've I'm been bullish on earnings. I just can't get myself even more bullish. And I've been bullish on the valuation. And there again, I don't want to go to the outer limits of this thing, and so I'm not rooting for 5,400 by the middle of the year. I right? uh, that that would create a problem for me of having to, you know, think hard whether this is really just turned into a bubble that's about to burst, or whether just to keep 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 riding this uh, bronco. Um, I guess I'm becoming a little bit uh, more convinced that AI uh, may very well be an important technology. Uh, for the roaring 2020s. Uh, I've been a little skeptical based on my chat GPT experience, but uh, uh, Jackie Dowdy keeps showing me all these uh, articles and uh, videos of uh, robots that uh, are now equipped with AI that can do all kinds of cool things. But uh, uh, we'll see. When I when I have my when, when Siri uh, or Alexa can really have a conversation with me and really provide me with accurate information and Try next chat. okay alexa never mind <laughs> there she yes. goes again alexa off so you mentioned her name she starts talking okay so uh how about this uh, monetarist theory i've had well read about it on your on your own uh, it's called postmodern monetary theory is the title of the uh, morning briefing and it just dawned on me that uh you know monetarism is, is an interesting theory it's basically mv equals PY, the money supply times velocity is equal to the price level uh, times uh, output. P is the price deflator and uh, you know that multiplied by Y or Q is the quantity of, uh, of output. So it's real GDP. And um, it's not really a theory, it's an identity. MV is always equal to PY, you know why? And the answer is uh, V is a residual. V is calculated as uh, PY divided by M. So it's uh, it's the velocity of money is uh, is always 
going to be a fudge factor. It's always going to uh, equilibrate the two sides. But the theory is that if the um, velocity of money is constant, then it kind of makes sense that money supply drives nominal GDP. And to, if you get close to uh, full employment, full capacity in the economy, then money supply drives uh, inflation. Um, and again, the uh, only fatal flaw with that is that velocity, which was relatively constant uh, up to uh, the late 1980s, hasn't been anything but constant. It hasn't been volatile, but it's gone up, it's gone down without any predict predictability wh whatsoever and without really correlating with interest rates or, or anything meaningful. So it's been basically useless as a, as a, as a theory, in, in my humble opinion. And I think uh, the experience of the past couple of years demonstrates that monetarism uh, you know, may explain some of the inflation, but not all of it. And it wasn't just, you know, money supply. It was also helicopter money. It was a combination of excessively stimulative monetary and fiscal policy that caused inflation. And notwithstanding all that stimulus, uh, look how quickly inflation has come down. And a lot of that had to do with the pandemic, the supply disruptions, and the reversal of the supply disruption. So inflation is a pretty complicated process that you really have to be relatively empirical about. You can't just, you know, be a doctrinaire about it. There just aren't that many theories, uh, any any real hard theory. So another uh, theory, of course, is modern monetary theory, which isn't modern. It's not monetary, and it's not a theory. Uh, but uh, it claims that the government uh, that prints its own money. Uh, um, uh, and uh, and has uh, no restrictions with regards to that, uh, where foreigners accept it as a reserve currency, especially uh, the government can just uh, print as much as it wants, stimulate as much as it wants. And if you get some inflation as a result of that, you use fiscal policy uh, to whack a mole, uh, uh, to play whack a mole with inflation by raising uh, taxes here and there. It's a wacky concept. It uh, got some credibility there during the pandemic, but uh, once inflation came roaring back, I think it lost. Uh, most, if not all, of its credibility. So what is postmodern monetary theory? It's simply my name for what I've been talking about for the past couple of years, actually since 2019, when Melissa and I observed that an inverted yield curve doesn't cause recession, it doesn't inevitably predict recessions, it predicts a process that has in the past led to recessions. And the process is yada, yada, yada. You know, uh, Fed tightens, uh, you get a financial crisis, get a credit crunch, get a recession. This time around, because of what the Fed learned during the great financial crisis, the Fed is awfully good at creating liquidity facilities that avert these uh, uh, liquidity crises. And now with the Fed funds rate at five and a quarter, five and a half percent, if consumers wake up one day and say, you know, we're not in the mood to spend anymore, then the Fed has plenty of room to lower interest rates if that's necessary. And uh, once again, there'll be no recession. The stock market will love it, and all, all will be well. So, uh, and another part of that uh, postmodern monetary theory, uh, which isn't modern, is, isn't uh, monetary, is a theory, I'll have to admit as well. It's really a credit cycle theory. Uh, and it's been uh, discussed by people like Irving Fisher in the 30s. He lost a fortune uh, in the Great Depression. And uh, I uh, felt so bad about it that he said, well, let me see if I can at least explain, you know, what I, wh why I was so wrong on the stock market. So he came up with a debt deflation theory. And then uh, Hyman Mis Minsky, um, even Bernanke talked about uh, the credit cycle at, at, in one paper. Uh, and then, of course, uh, for those of you uh, my age, you we all remember the great uh, Albert Wojnarowski and Henry Kaufman, both still al alive and well, I hope. Um, and uh, they also talked about credit crunches uh, as being a, an important way to understand how the business cycle operates. So that is all, folks. Let me see. I didn't really want to get into the charts. You can get into yourself. These last two charts say it all. Uh, here's the financial crises. And so the Fed eases when a financial crisis hits the fan, the financial crisis, they lower rates. Uh, but that's not enough to uh, ease the liquidity problems. They get a recession, they lower rates some more, and that's enough to start recovering the economy. So let's go to the Q&A here. Okay, uh, Ian, your thoughts on unemployment rate is higher than calculated, reading that college students are having a more difficult time attaining a job 
versus 2023 more auto automation and less hiring yeah i mean again uh, this uh, this question uh, is something that uh, is close to home to me uh, i got a couple of uh, i got five kids and two of them are just out of college recently and it hasn't been easy finding jobs and it's kind of puzzling right you would think that uh, why <laughs> With the unemployment rate so low, well, you know, they, they don't want to be waiters and waitresses. They, they aren't qualified to work in the healthcare industry. They're not pilots. They're not stewardesses. Um, and the, the problem is uh, college is a ripoff. I mean, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand bucks uh, to get a degree in the, in the same field as everybody else. All these kids are taking marketing and finance uh, uh, and, uh, you know, PR and uh, they're, they're all... They're all competing with each other, and there just aren't that many jobs in that area. What happened to the good old days when people diversified and got into engineering and sciences and things like that? But anyways, so uh, I, I I think those any any of those young kids who don't have a job uh, are, um, are are included in the unemployment rate. So that's really it. it the economy is doing pretty well in the face of that. M2 growth peaked at nearly 30% year over year, highest in history. Could it be that process of long and variable lags is not linear, that it takes a longer lag to sop that up M2 expansion given the scale? The answer is, yeah, I'm a reasonable guy. I mean, it's it's possible that that's, that, that's the story, but it's not my story. Uh, my story is that uh, M2, uh, like the leading indicators, like inverted yield curves has been somewhat misleading. I think it kind of got the it, it did get the in, inflation making a comeback, um, and I guess you could say on a year over year basis uh, it's been coming down. Um, but if you look at the actual level, it's just kind of like you know it went up, then up some more during the pandemic, and now it's kind of come down to to the trend. So, uh, and again, I, I don't I don't as a forecaster, I haven't found it to be a particularly useful tool in uh, in projecting things, and I found things that make more sense to me, like supply chain disruptions, like uh, people uh, having excess savings accumulated during the pandemic to explain inflation. And uh, I think we did okay. I mean, we, back in uh, the summer of 2022, basically nailed the uh, inflation trajectory so far so good. Uh, to really get it right, we got to get it down to 2 to 3% on the PCED by the uh, end of the year. And I think we're still going in that direction, notwithstanding the hot uh, uh, week we had last week uh, with money, uh, with uh, inflation. Uh, William, uh, one of the Barron's articles you showed that you are reading, you are reading talked about the increase in lending rates and jump in housing prices are inflationary costs that aren't shown in the inflation measures that are making consumers depressed. Uh, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. You're, you're talking about uh, Randy Forsythe article about why consumers uh, in the polls are saying they're not happy uh, when the unemployment rate is so low. And uh, Randy, I think, quoted someone else as saying, "Well, look at interest rates. Uh, they got to pay a lot more for interest rates. Home prices have gone up. So you're, yeah. I, I think it makes sense. I mean, people who want a house are depressed. Young people who want a job uh, are depressed. So you can you can certainly look at pockets." Uh, of, uh, of the economy where people aren't doing well, uh, it's always the case uh, that that's going to be the uh, be happening. But maybe there's more pockets this time around, and so when you look at you look at them, you kind of wonder like, so why does this all add up to uh, a recession? Why don't we see consumers a lot more depressed? And the answer is a lot of people are still doing quite well. Uh, certainly, the retiring baby boomers are feeling pretty good. Their uh, personal costs. Of, uh, of taking care of kids and all that has gone down. And uh, they're probably 40% of uh, homeowners who have a house don't have a mortgage. And probably a lot of those are baby boomers. So there's a lot of go lot going on here. And uh, I try to factor all that in. Some of these things are kind of touchy feely. You can't really measure them. Um, and you got to have a feeling for them. And I have a, uh, I have a, some inside information. I'm a baby boomer. So I, I guess I get to, to see a little bit of, of that from, uh, some of my friends. I'll take one last que question here. Uh, Cagnus, if the Fed capitulates this week in its SEP projections and changes 2024 dots down from three to two cuts and potentially also move a further out dots higher as well, uh, does that decisively change sentiment in equities negative for a while? Or do you think 
any dip in stocks that gets bought quickly by the market. Uh, I, I think it dips dips get bought. Uh, I think the trade off to disappointment on uh, rates coming down is that we don't need to have rates come down because the economy isn't that weak. And so we get earnings out of it. We get a, a stronger economy, a healthier consumer, um, a f a full full employment uh, f for longer with, with low inflation. And uh, I think much will depend on whether this productivity story that I've been telling that seems to be coming to fruition, at least in the last three quarters of last year, we certainly seem to have gotten some data and that uh, supports the idea that productivity is coming back. Uh, then the market would certainly love that. And this, meanwhile, it's, the market loves uh, AI. And uh, well, let's see what the market looks like tomorrow morning. Uh, you know, um, the uh, the initial hype, uh, will the, the love fest at San Jose starts uh, this afternoon. Uh, let's let's see how the market greets the the initial reaction to uh, what uh, the CEO of uh, Nvidia has to say uh, about uh, what's what's ahead of us. I'm sure it's going to be very very exciting. Question is whether it's already in the market, uh, and then of course uh, the market will immediately start turning around to uh, J J uh, J Powell's um, presser, and I expect he's going to be sounding more hawkish, and I I think they they will kind of pull back on this uh, idea of uh, we're not far off from uh, lowering interest rates to, uh, you know, um, we're we're comfortable where we are now. We're going to watch the data and uh, take it from there. I think they'll be le less, less uh, willing to embrace the idea that they're definitely going to be cutting interest rates anytime soon. Um, so with that, uh, let me thank you all for tuning in once again, and I'll see you next week. All the best for the week ahead. Thank mm -hmm. you.